Hello there, and welcome once again to the Old Roach Motel, the Josh Potter Show. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, for clicking on us once again. And if you subscribe and if you rate and review on iTunes and all of the audio platforms, boy, do I love you. And if you subscribe on YouTube, same deal. Love you very much. And uh, please to be continuing to subscribe if you don't already. Click that little bell, too, on the YouTube, and you'll get notifications when the uploads come along. Follow along on Instagram at Josh underscore Potter, on Twitter at J underscore Potter. There you'll find links to all my shows. Right now, we just got one to talk about for the moment. March 11th, Portland, Oregon. Boy, oh boy, am I excited. One late-ass show amongst a myriad of John Lovett shows. I'm just doing one late-ass show. So come on out, Friday Night Late Show. It is going to be quite the time. And I hope you join us there. Other than that, please to be continuing to get subscribed at the Patreon because it's been so much fun. Posted up uh, the Milwaukee incident, an hour-long almost hostage situation that turned my way. It was very much like that movie where uh, Pacino's saying Attica over and over again. It was like that. Eventually, the crowd was on my side, and I got a whole bunch of Green Bay Packer fans, I assume, to root for the Buffalo Bills with me. It was quite the time. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. If you have watched it on the Patreon, just five bucks a month, that's all it costs. And plus, you'll get a a podcast with me and my buddy Matt Bergman, and uh, he's going to come out here and be on the program down the road, which I'm excited for. Today is an interesting show, and I'm not quite sure how ready I am to tackle this sort of thing, but what with all the war happening over in the in uh, Ukraine, I, and I have to stop myself from saying the Ukraine, like, like that girl that was, remember that girl that was like, and places such as the Iraq, that's what I feel like I sound like every time I say the Ukraine. People say, why is that, do you think, Kirsten? The Ukraine is that a Soviet thing? I don't know, honestly. What do I've you heard call it a few it? times. Do you I call think it? I, ju- I think just Ukraine. I don't Thank think I throw you. the the in there. Yeah, I, I've I've been told that is not accurate. But with everything happening, and I've been very obsessed. When I was in San Diego, and thank you by the way, if you came out to the Whistle Stop Bar to check out that show, so many roaches crawling out from under the fridge and coming out to the Whistle Stop Bar had such a great time down in San Diego. But the weather left something to be desired. And it was very windy, very cold, and I stayed inside, and I probably would have ended up staying inside if it was beautiful out the two days that I spent there because I was so entranced by what was happening over in Ukraine. I couldn't stop watching footage and things like that, and, uh, you know, I I found myself, this is odd to say, and especially because I don't live there and I'm not experiencing what the people of Ukraine are experiencing, obviously— Uh, But I find their resilience very inspiring. Like, I'm almost looking at this in a more optimistic way than I've looked at many a thing. And this is probably the darkest incident to happen uh, to a modern country in quite some time. I mean, it's just wild. I mean, not since World War II have we seen something like this. Although one could venture to say, you know, uh, the United States made some... uh, miscalculations and some sort of invasions over the past 20 years and i would agree with that uh, wholeheartedly but at the same time this is uh, something that is very unprecedented and i came to find that there are roaches in ukraine who listen to this program and i thought who better to discuss this than them who are on the ground out there and you know they're they're still listening to this fucking show (laughs) which is insane i figured they got better things to listen to or something like that um and i and you know it's it's i'm gonna find out when we have him on but i believe to pronounce this gentleman's name it's uh zevalad uh dobrovolsky that is the first person we will talk to and he is a, a photographer by trade and he is a roach first and foremost and so obviously the men over there 16 to 60, maybe even 80. I'm not sure what the age restrictions or uh, parameters were, I should say. But all the men have to fight. And I thought about, you know, if that ever happened here in America, boy, oh boy, I feel like I would be more of a hindrance than an asset in that kind of thing. I'd be like, really, all of us? 
Me? You want me out there? Just firing away? I don't, is that a Russian? Is it a grandma? I don't know. I'm not going to be able to see. So my point is, uh, it's very harrowing. And I, I could never imagine being in that type of position. And I couldn't imagine, you know, if that happened to our country, I feel like it would be less unified. Like, I can't help but be pessimistic about if that happened on U.S. shores. Like, if it if they, you know, say Russia invaded a red state, all the coastal elites will be like, good, invade those racists. And then if the inverse happened and they invaded, you know, a blue place, the red people would be like, let those coastal elites deal with it. You know, it would get very fractured, I fear. But that's what I find the... the uh, Ukrainian people, ins incredibly inspiring, and they are led by a gentleman who is inspiring in his own right, this Zelensky fellow, the president of Ukraine, who, if you don't already know, and I'm sure you do by this point, if you've been reading anything about it, former comedian. Just three years ago, the man was like a film star and a comedian, and at one point he even performed on a show where he played the president. It was like a comedy show. And that led me to think, you know, who could we have become president out of our ranks of comedian? And I can only think of one. And I'm going to lobby for this person to run for president, John Stewart. If Kirsten, you can think of another comedian. I mean, we can ban it. You want, I could, you know, you want Burt Kreischer to be president? I don't think so. No, I mean, honestly, I think you, I think you hit it on the head there. I think that's a good bet. And I bet you John Stewart never wants to be the president. He'll be like, oh, why would I want to do that? And I don't understand why this Zelensky wanted to be the president. He had such a flourishing career. With a career like that, I would be like, president, get out of town. But obviously he has some sort of uh, great deal of patriotism to want to be the president and give up this television life and give up this uh, show business life, which he could have probably translated down the road to uh, some American stardom and even more money. He gave all that up to be the president, and now he's finding himself at the front lines and being the figurehead of inspiration for the Ukrainian people. And he's out there fighting arm in arm with them. And I'm curious to find out when we have um, uh, Zevalod, I believe is how you say his name. We're going to find out when we have him on. I haven't spoken to him verbally yet, so haven't been able to hear him say his name to me, but I'm going to assume that I'm getting it wrong like I do everything else. Uh, but when we talk to him, I'm, gonna, I'm wondering, is he, uh, you know, He's out there in, in Kiev, Kiev, and he's out there. Is he fighting? I mean, has he seen action? The message when I firmed things up to talk to him today was, it is 8.15 and I'm still alive. <laughs> so <laughs> let's hope he stays alive for uh, the rest of the time, obviously, but at least the very next two hours so we could talk to him and find out what's going on over there. But Oksana is the other uh, person that I wanted to talk to today, and she's another roach out there in Ukraine. And I'm not sure if she's fled by this point, and I don't even know if she wants to disclose her location. So we'll find those out when we have them on in the second half of the program. But yeah, I mean, could you imagine if Biden had to fight the way Zelensky does? I don't try. I don't feel feel very good about Biden being that type of they would definitely not let him. And like I said, you you want me out there on that front lines? I don't think so. You don't want Joe Biden out there either. Here he is at the State of the Union discussing uh, the Russian attack. Putin may circle Kiev with tanks, but he'll never gain the hearts and souls of the Iranian people. He'll never he'll never see the certain love of freedom. The what? And he will the never. Iranian people. Now they say, and everyone's like, he said Iranian, Iranian. No, he said Uranian, as in people from Uranus. Which is worse. I would have been like, oh, he said Iranian. That's a little bit of a mistake, you know, a little foreshadowing, maybe some Freudian slip. But no, he said Uranian as if they were aliens from the planet Uranus. I don't want that man fighting. <laughs> you know, I don't want him being out there being like, we're going to be in here in Washington, D.C. And I won't let him take it. And it's like, you're going to end up letting them take it because you are in no way, shape or form <laughs> capable of fighting. I, we need to get a young dude like Zelensky in there, just in case, you know, I've, but I've never been more inspired by something than the resilience of the Ukrainian people. And I hope that uh, they keep up the good fight. And we will discuss all of this with two Ukrainian roaches later on in the program. But let's get into some other news around the world, shall we? <laughs> it 
And as the nice boy clock expires, it's the perfect time because an Ohio teacher, I think she did some wonderful service here, but uh, it seems to be a bit of a gaffe that found her in a bit of hot water. This Ohio teacher airdropped her sex tape to 200 people. Now, my, oh, my, where did she do this? When did, was she on the subway? Was she uh, at the park and happened to do this? Was she at home and did it to her apartment complex? Let's find out. A teacher at Gin Academy in Cleveland, Ohio, has been suspended after an unfortunate incident involving an intimate encounter. According to Cleveland.com, a video showing the unidentified teacher and her boyfriend made the rounds after it was mysteriously airdropped to 200 high school students. We don't have this teacher's picture, do we? Because uh, I just want to see if she's hot. But um, it says unidentified teacher, so I don't think we have the picture. That would lead me to believe that we don't have the picture. The teacher admitted the video was on her cell phone, but says she never sent it to anyone. So here's what happened. She was unidentified in the video. No one could really make two cents of who it was. The unfortunate thing is when you airdrop something to someone, it tells you where it came from. So she's like, I, 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 I. It was on my phone, but... It wasn't me. Cleveland Metropolitan School District spokesperson Thomas Ott says the teacher has been removed from the school and will not be working with students while the Cleveland Police Sex Crimes Unit detectives investigate. See, that's where it could get a little sticky. It could become a sticky wicket, you see, because what if she airdropped them to children? Now she's sending pornography to children. That's tough. Our collective bargaining agreement with the district provides for a process that protects our members, the district, and students when accusations are made involving members. The Cleveland Teachers Union said in a statement, we will work with our member and the district through this process. So it doesn't say if any, if you're a kid and you narked on that, shame. What kind of kid are you? Teacher just sent you her nude doing it. I wouldn't tell the world. Like it says 200 people. I would hope all 200 were adults who turned her in. If they were children... They would have been girls, probably. <laughs> That's what I'm going to assume. I would, if I got it, I'd be one of those silent people. They probably have like, I would say 50 more who they could tack on here that received it, but I wouldn't tell the world. I'd be like, oh, I might have got it, but I didn't. I'm not telling anybody. I'm keeping this fucking thing. Like it's a, like it's a deer head that I just hunted and I have a trophy on my wall. That's really the way I think of nudes. I think of it like taxidermy, you know? You know when Ace Ventura walks into that room and he goes, oh, a lovely room of death. Yes, absolutely. I love that movie. Yes, that's what I have in my phone, <laughs> essentially. Ah, a lovely room of poon. It is just, I have to throw my phone in the ocean if I ever meet a woman because it is just a quagmire of past nudes. I save them and I don't show them to, it's not like I distribute or, do, or show them, I just keep them for myself, you know, so I could, it's one of my few accomplishments in the world is collecting all of those and again i don't share them i don't show them they're all for me i get to go into my little womb of nudes and then i get to explore a time when this person desired me or that person it's it's really quite something but again uh if i get into a relationship this phone gotta go in the garbage we gotta start over give me a new cloud apple you know pretend i don't exist erase my identity this story coming out of our uh, out of my hometown and this is something that I always, I don't fear this necessarily, but the thing about flying that freaks me out is pilot error. And there's no controlling that. If a pilot fucks up and crashes that plane, you got nothing. It's just shit luck for every soul on board. And I always wondered, you know, because of how automated it seems to me, a, you know, a person who is obviously a neophyte in aerodynamics and uh, engineering and piloting and all those sorts of things. It seems quite automatic, though, for the most part, to eliminate a lot of error. Well, in my hometown of Buffalo, New York, there was a JetBlue pilot removed from the cockpit of the plane on suspicion he was intoxicated. So this guy just pulled up. He got onto the plane. He got into the cockpit. He was probably like, hey, there are toots. He slapped the stewardess's ass. And then, you know, she was like, is he, I smell booze on his breath. He's leaning over. He's like, Jeff, you ready, buddy? You know, he's getting all excited. They're like, this guy's fucking tossed right now. According to the Niagara Frontier Transportation Authority, the NFTA, know them well. Know many people in the ranks of the NFTA. Uh, Clifton, this is the 
pilot's name. He was passing through security Wednesday when TSA officers noticed the pilot may be impaired. He walked by, they're like, this guy smells like a fucking dirty martini. What the fuck? Sir, can I pat you down? They're like, oof, Jesus. NFTA police were notified and Clifton was removed from the cockpit. The pilot was reportedly given a breathalyzer test and registered a blood alcohol content level of 0.17. 0.17? That's insane. That's like you just drove your car off a cliff type level of... That's like board, you get blackout drunk at 0.17, can't you? I mean, shit. That seems uh, excessive. According to the FAA, pilots should not be flying with a BAC over 0.04. The fact that they allow them 0.04 is pretty fucking nuts, too. I mean, what? I mean, I guess we can drive a car up to 0.08, but even then, if you get pulled over with something under 0.08, you still get, like, a impaired sort of ticket or whatever. So the fact the FAA is like, eh, 0.04, you're cool. How many, you had a beer, like, earlier today? You're fine. I don't even know what how you can... I, I bet if I took, like, a half a high noon down right now, I'd be .04. You know what I mean? The flight, JetBlue 2465, was delayed four hours and ten minutes, according to data from FlightAware, probably why they, or uh, while they looked for a new fucking pilot. I mean, how else are you? That's tough. But there's not much else to do in Buffalo when you're on a layover than drink. I mean, let's be fair. Uh, you know, Buffalo is where my heart is. It's my hometown. I love it very much. But when I get home, I mean, it is a mess. It's like I regressed 12 years or something like that. I'm 22 again, and I'm just drinking my face off. It is a drinking town, of course. He was taken into custody but released to JetBlue security. He could still face federal charges. That's scary as shit, though. Just being like... It is so automatic, though. You wonder how many times has that... Because that can't be the first time that guy drank before he got on a plane. They always say that about drunk drivers, too. They're like, if you get pulled over for drunk driving, you got caught that time. That was the first time you got caught. You know? Same thing with this guy. So he's probably gone up and down the old East Coast, flying people left and right. Don't you want to find out if this guy flew your plane? Clifton was his name. We don't get a... We don't get a blue book on the pilots. That's one thing I wish we got, you know, in the pamphlet with the safety p- precautions and the safety measures. Give me a pilot blue book where I can look at the history of this man. How many hours he spent in the air? What is he used to flying? How many times has he flown this type of aircraft? Has he gotten wasted before and arrested? Don't you want to know if this guy's on the plane future? You know, he's going to get his fucking job back and he's going to be flying us all around. That's why I'm a, United man. Well, Pat Sajak in the news, <laughs> he's had it with you, Twitter. And I always said Pat Sajak is getting sick of his job to the point where he's getting a little spicy with the contestants. But in this case, he had every right to get spicy with the contestants. I saw a video of this and I wish I would have shared it with you because uh, I found it just before I arrived today. Um, I wonder if I can... I'm never going to be able to fucking find it. But it was absolutely infuriating watching a contestant try to figure out, put a feather in your cat. They kept saying, put a feather in your hat, put a feather in your lap, put a feather. They could not figure this out. It went around and around. And Pat Zajac had the patience of a saint. But then Twitter went haywire. They started shitting all over the contestants. I think they found their Twitter handles and they're like, are you a fucking dumb dumb? They called them probably a bunch of 90s words involving their intelligence and things like that. And Pat Sajak got super upset. Here's how his tweet thread read. It always pains me when nice people come on the show to play our game and win some money and maybe fulfill a lifelong dream. And then they are subjected to online ridicule when they make a mistake or something goes awry. So Pat Sajak is angered by this. He explains the feather in your cap sort of uh, situation here in, in his tweet thread. Sitting at home, it seems incredible that they couldn't solve it, but I knew in real time what was happening. The first attempted solve was feather in your hat, which, by the way, is how a lot of people say it. So all three players thought it was a good solve, and they were stunned when I said it was wrong. Now imagine you're on national television, and you're suddenly thrown a curve, and you begin getting worried about looking stupid. Well, they really dug into that. They looked very stupid. I mean, it is. And Pat Sajak is in real time watching this, and he's just like, oh, Jesus. Maybe now he knows 
how Twitter is going to react, calling them R words and things like that. So he's feeling more sympathetic because I think if he would have went the way, you know, he was going and there was no Twitter, Pat Sajak was starting to get a little spicy too. Been like, what are you, dumb? After, you know, he was starting to get a little like, I can't believe it. But in this case, he starts uh, feeling sympathy for all of these folks. He says, now imagine you're on national television, you're suddenly thrown a curve, and you begin getting worried about looking stupid. And if the feather isn't in your hat, where the heck could it be? You start flailing away, looking for alternatives rather than the synonym for hat. And of course, when it's solved, you want to crawl in a hole. I've been praised online for keeping it together, which is funny because he hasn't. He's been ridiculed online for shitting on people. <laughs> I keep it together so great and not making fun of the players. Truth is, all I want to do is help to get them through it and convince them that those things happen to even very bright people. Well, that's very nice of him. Alas, I really do think that he wants to be like, are you fucking dumb? It's cap. Put a feather in your cap. You fucking don't you go to college? Jesus, Lord. But mocking them online and calling them names. These are good people in a bad situation. I don't know about that. I think good people in a bad situation, we're going to talk to them in a little while here in Ukraine. I think fucking up on Wheel of Fortune is first world problems to the max, you know? They can suffer from a little couple barbs and arrows on Twitter, you know, after playing Wheel of Fortune. I don't think there, I think there's worse things going on in the world. Good nature laughter is one thing. Heck, they laughed at themselves, but hey, cut them some slack. Unless you're there, you have no idea how different it is in the studio i have fun with players and i tease them occasionally <laughs> now he's admitting to some of his <laughs> his teasings but when things go wrong i feel for them and i try to saw uh, salve the wounds on camera and off so yeah it was an oddly entertaining puzzle and it's okay to laugh at the situation but have a little heart after all you may be there one day and no one wants to trend on twitter well isn't that the truth no one wants to... trending on twitter used to be like hey you're trending now it's like, hey, you're trending. Not good. It's never good when you're trending. Pat Sajak knows that to be the truth. Today's Josh Potter Show is brought to us by Stitch Fix. And when it comes to looking good, Stitch Fix has you covered. My goodness, I suck at picking out clothes. I just can't be bothered. But Stitch Fix makes it kind of fun, actually. It's like a whole process. It's like they're designing it just for your style. And your style isn't obviously one size fits all. It's all about what suits your body and what suits the moment. And that's where Stitch Fix comes in. They are showing me things that I never even thought would be up my alley. And here I am going like, hey, that would look good on me. Thank you, Stitch Fix, for pointing that. I never would have had the courage to even think about something like that. Whether you need refined workwear or casual basis, basics, Stitch Fix can help elevate your style in any capacity. You can schedule a fix, and a style expert will send you five pieces that fit your style, size, and price range. They'll send items that work for your unique frame so you can look and feel your best from sunup to sundown. Keep what you like, and you can return the rest for free. To get started, take a style quiz at Stitch Fix. It's actually a fun thing to do, this style quiz. You learn a little bit about yourself from it as well. From your favorite colors to preferred fits and price ranges, they'll help you get easily fresh items from brands that you know and trust. It's time to style smarter, not harder. So get started today by filling out your free style quiz at stitchfix.com slash josh and take advantage of free shipping and returns. That's stitchfix.com slash josh to try Stitch Fix. Stitchfix.com slash josh. Today's Josh Potter show is brought to us by DoorDash, and I can't tell you how much I hate to be inconvenienced by little nonsense, whether it be buying razors at the pharmacy or the or the convenience store or going to get groceries or even just getting a meal from a restaurant you know i want it all delivered to my front door and with doordash it is possible my friend i mean hell you could have a busy lifestyle sometimes i'm just lazy flat out but your life might be busy and you might have you know back-to-back -back meetings errands to run things like that chores to take care of a little help from DoorDash goes a long way. Everything just delivered right to you, whether it be groceries, odds and ends, or just something from your favorite restaurant, my friend. And right now, for a limited time, my listeners are able to get 20% off and zero delivery fees for their first order of $15 or more when they download the DoorDash app and enter code Josh. So go down, download the app in your phone, put in code Josh, and you get 25% off up to $10 value and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the app store and enter code Josh. Don't forget that's code Josh for 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Subject to change and terms apply. 
this is interesting. This comes to us. Uh, this came to me through a lot of people. And uh, actually, is this the one I'm thinking of? This is a different one. Woman who beep beep beep. beep. Oop. Yes. Okay. No, I want this one. This one from Jennifer. Jennifer wrote and she goes, "This woman smoked a whole bunch of meth, and then." She was doing it with her boyfriend. She was smoking the meth with her boyfriend. And during sex, because, you know, when you when you do meth, you want to fuck. That's one thing I learned about meth. You see these people out in the street doing it. Boy, do they want to fuck. That's all they want to do. They're just like, ah. They just want to fucking fuck. So they fucked. And then she started to choke him. And she liked doing that a little too much, according to Jennifer here. Uh, after she choked him to death... Uh, she decided to chop him up into pieces and she put his head and his pee-pee into a bucket and then dropped those off to his mother's house. And then she said, thanks for being so great, Josh. My husband and I have listened since the YMH days and look forward to every Tuesday. Keep up the good work. She ended it so sweetly after describing the dismembership and meth. Oh, oh murder. Officers found several... Uh, found a several. I thought it's several. It said severed. Officers found a severed head in a bucket at a home in Green Bay's West Side and body parts in other locations and scenes reminiscent of a gory horror movie. Uh, Taylor Shaw Business. What a fucking Milwaukee name that is. Green or a Wisconsin name. Shaw Business Twenty Four is charged with first degree intentional homicide, mut- mutilating a corpse, and third degree sexual assault. Keep that. I didn't know mutilating a corpse was a charge in itself. That's interesting to know. Keep that in mind as you are dismembering your bodies out there. A court commissioner set her bond at $2 million at a hearing Tuesday afternoon. Shaw business seemed calm when she appeared at the Brown County Court via video conference. She said very little, only acknowledging that she has the right to an attorney. The prosecutor called this one of the most serious offenses we've had in this county in some time. Uh, The state argued Shaw Business has ties to Texas, raising concern that she might be a flight risk. The prosecution also said that uh, she was put on probation seven weeks before the crime and is supposed to be wearing an electronic monitoring bracelet, but apparently removed it somehow. I don't know that that monitoring bracelet can tell if you're doing meth at home and fucking your boyfriend to death. But hey, you know. Maybe it, maybe they're more advanced than I give them credit for. I think the facts alleged are extremely concerning and disturbing and go to the violent nature and grave nature of this offense. Uh, so I want to get to the details as to what happened here. I don't give a shit about how outraged the judge is. So uh, they got a complaint, evidently, at 3.25 a.m. Police were called to the home by a person living there who reported finding her son's severed head in a bucket. That's the mom. Oh, my God. Could you imagine? Ding dong. It's my son's head and his penis in a bucket. Oh, my Lord. The woman told police she's heard a door slam between 2 and 3 a.m. waking her. She went to check on a light, left on downstairs, and made the gruesome discovery. Dried blood was found on a nearby mattress. Police learned that Taylor may have been the last person to be seen with the victim, identified only as a 25-year-old man. They found her at a home on Eastman Avenue. She had dried blood all over her clothing. If you're going to cut up the body and distribute the parts and try to hide them, change the clothes, lady. Big misstep there. Police obtained search warrant for the home on Stony Brook Lane, which belonged to the victim's mother. In addition to the human head, they found a male organ in the bucket that would be his penis what else would it be just say fucking penis what are we six we're talking about a murder here and they can't even say penis a male organ what else could it be there's no other male organ we don't have any other organs that you have you don't have right no no i think that's all it's got to be penis it's got to be a dick and balls what about prostate that that i mean that could be too but I, I don't know. That'd be a weird one to just single out. That'd be crazy if she carved out his yeah. prostate and put it in a bucket. Gave that to mommy. Yeah, here you go, mommy. Here's his prostate. I used to milk this to make him come. <laughs> Anywho, they also found body fluid and knives. In a storage tote, tote, excuse me, they found an upper torso. So she just was like, let's throw this in a Tupperware container. Uh, police interviewed the woman and asked her what happened. She replied, that's a good question. <laughs> sure is. I'd like to know, too. If you figure it out, let me know, because holy hell, 
last first thing, I mean, I remember getting railed and I'm choking him. And then next thing I know, I've got a head in a fucking bucket and a torso and a Tupperware. Shaw Business said she and the victim were together all day Tuesday and they've been smoking meth. After they arrived at the Stony Brook home, they were having sex in incorporated chains. Oh, my. Shaw Business said she blacked out during part of it, uh, but then just went crazy and started strangling the man. Oh, you know how that happens during sex, you know? You're about to come and you're just like, I'm going to choke you to death. That's why I won't do the choking. I'll pretend, you know, I'll put my hand there, maybe do a little pressure. But at the end of the day, I'm not like when they're getting a little too crazy with it. I'm like, are you trying to frame me for murder here? What are we doing? Is there a hidden camera here? And I'm going to go to get Taylor Boward here or Trevor Boward here. What's going to happen? Shaw Business told investigators she did not mean to kill the victim, but she definitely enjoyed choking him and continued to do it. So I would say that was an admission of guilt right there. Prosecutors say the sexual assault charge is for acts that happened after the victim died. Shaw Business responded uh, that the police were going to have fun trying to find all the organs that she dismembered of the body. Shaw Business stated all the body parts should be in the basement. (laughs) And she stated that there should be a foot or a leg in a minivan. Detective Graff asked the woman what she did with the head. And she told or she stated that she had put the victim's head in a black bucket and put a blanket over it. The complaint continues that Shaw Business stated she used knives that she obtained from the kitchen of the residence and that a bread knife worked the best because of the serrated blade. I wonder what kind of knives those were. That'd be a good endorsement. Hey, these fucking meth heads can chop up bodies with them. I mean, that's how good, that's how sharp these bad boys are. Shaw Business stated the knives should be in a black bag along with the body parts in the basement. She indicated that she would use whatever bag she found in the basement to place the body parts into. That's real meth cleaning right there. You know how like, they're like, oh God, you know, they're listening to me in my dirt and they're just scrubbing their fucking shower or whatever you know what i mean they get crazy that's what this woman she's just throwing body parts into bags She's like i gotta get rid of them and then they're just hiding in the bags but they're really not gone and then she said good luck figuring it all out it's like a little puzzle piece now for the detective shaw business stated that her plan was for her to bring all the body parts with her but she got lazy and only ended up putting a leg and foot in the van and she forgot the rest Police, forensic teams, and the Dane County Medical Examiner's Office investigated and processed multiple locations associated with the crime. That's crazy that she just, you know, she had one hit too little for the meth. If she had one more meth hit, she could have put all those body parts into the van. Maybe we would be dealing with things a little differently, but that's what happens, you know, they crash. And then she just got lazy. Police met with the victim's family Tuesday. Officials have not released the victim's name, but they are asking for privacy for his family. Shaw business is scheduled back into court into three weeks. Well, thank you for that wonderful, heartwarming tale of meth murder. Oh, oh, murder. That from Jennifer, a roach reporter out and about. We have another one here that uh, explores a bit of murder. This woman who killed a lotto winner decided that she wants to back a bill to keep the identity of lotto winner secret. It's like she goes, I wouldn't have killed this person if you people would have kept this secret. That's the headline here. A bill awaiting the governor's signature that would temporarily keep secret the names of lottery winners in Florida has at least one unexpected supporter, the woman in prison for murdering the winner of a $30 million lottery payout. D.D. Moore says publicly identifying recipients and details about big lottery payouts puts their lives at risk. Boy, this woman should know. I mean, she's like telling them she's like, you're just dangling it out there for me. How am I supposed to not murder this person when you're telling me their name and shit? Duh, I'm going to murder them. Keep that shit a secret and I won't murder them. Makes sense to me. The jury convicted Moore back in December of 2012 of first degree murder in the 2009 shooting death of Abraham Lee Shakespeare. What a name. The appeals court upheld the conviction in 2015 and again in 2019, calling her own continuing claims of innocence, confusing, conclusory and vague. I don't know what that means, but she said she intends to continue her legal appeals. The bill in Florida's legislature would keep 
a secret for 90 days the name of lottery winners of 250 grand or more unless the winner wants to be publicly identified why would they want to identify them anyways if they want to keep it a secret indefinitely why can't it be there right why do they have to disclose who won i guess for proprietary reasons so people aren't like you're keeping it a secret because you're stealing the money that's the problem people get so agitated they're all upset they think a conspiracy is happening so now these poor people have to get outed as millionaires and then they get targets on their fucking head there's no more to this story i agree with that bill and this woman is definitely an advocate for it she's like hey you know if you're gonna fucking tell me their names i'm gonna murder them it's as simple as that it's as simple as that well the furry community let a man slip through the cracks. This comes to us by Jason Brown, a Roach Reporter nominee uh, from last year, I do believe. On Tuesday, Benjamin Jeffrey Smith was identified as a suspect in Saturday's deadly shooting at a Justice for Amir Locke rally in Portland, Oregon, which I will be in in March 11th at Helium Comedy Club. And he was charged with murder and attempted murder as details of his online persona began coming out. According to those who know him, he is openly anti-Semitic and actively engaged in hateful discourse. Oh, my. So he's a you could be a furry, but don't you dare be a Jew furry because he hates you. One stood out at some in uh, to some in particular role playing fandom. He appeared to have spent time in the forum devoted to furries. Dio, a furry who identifies as the Tasmanian devil describes efforts to eliminate hate from their forums for about a half a decade. I've infiltrated these alt-right furry chat groups. So evidently the furries are very alt-right, very strange <laughs> sort of cross breeding here. Alt-right furries. I don't know. Like, are there certain animals that they couldn't be? I guess, you know, Disney, Walt Disney seems like the ultimate furry and he definitely hated the Jews. You know, he's got all those like Pooh Bear and all that shit running around his Disney World. That's like furry heaven, is it not? I would love to have a furry on here to just really describe the discourse because I could be saying some some massively sweeping statements that are offensive to furries during all of this. But I'm just going to go ahead and continue because, you know, at the end of the day, this is not your average furry. These are the alt-right furries. And evidently they are a problem. For about a half a decade... This man infiltrated the alt-right furry chat groups to identify these people before they enact violence. Obviously, in the case of Polybun, that's the name of this fucking person, I guess, uh, referring to the handle used by Smith, he slipped my radar and I'm fucked up over it. According to Patch, editor-in-chief of Dog Patch Press, a blog covering the furry community, it's not an isolated event. He says some have compared the shooting to the July 2020 murder of Garrett Foster by Daniel Perry, a radicalized furry. Do they show up in the costumes and start shooting? Because that is the ultimate nightmare, I would say. If you got some fucking Tasmanian devil showing up and he's like, blah, 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 and he's got a fucking AK-47, that's my nightmare. You know, it's not if a regular guy just shows up with a gun, you're kind of like, OK, shoot or whatever. But if it's the furry now, I see every costume I see forever. I'm going to be fucking traumatized. It's going to be wild. I hope they would show up. They're just like furry murderers. There's a very dedic fairly dedicated little fringe of malcontents who want to hurt people because they're damaged inside. However, the furry community is vigorously sending the message that violence is not welcome. So the furry community is trying to get ahead of this. You can't be a furry and a Nazi at the same time. <laughs> I would. Is there any fur? Is there any furries out there that are Nazis? That would be interesting. And like literal. Like I'm saying, they wear a Nazi costume. There's definitely cartoons from back in the '40s of Nazis, aren't there? Just dress up like that. That would be wild. They still try, but there's no place they should belong. Interesting. Bad people exist everywhere, but they are largely not tolerated by the furry community. This is not who we are. So the furry community trying to get ahead of it, trying to protect protect the uh, the name of furries, really, at the end of the day. And they're worrying about the alt-right infiltration. If you're a furry out there, please to be reaching out. Josh Potter Show at gmail.com. I would love to discuss not only the furry community, but the alt-right faction of the furry community it seems like hell it seems like absolute hell oh boy 
I'm jumping in here, folks, because today's Josh Potter show has a brand new sponsor, one that I'm extraordinarily excited to have on board. It is DraftKings Sportsbook. And we talk about gambling all the time on this program. And if you're not doing it with DraftKings, I don't think you're doing it the right way, my friend. I mean, the conference championships are coming up. And with DraftKings, now you can turn your team's victory into your own win. And the Big East tournament might be my favorite. It's at the Mecca, Madison Square Garden. And I've been riding the Providence Friars this whole time. I'm going to ride them all the way through. If they make it to the bracket, I'm taking them all the way. So I'm most definitely taking them when it comes to the Big East uh, tournament coming up here. And right now with DraftKings Sportsbook, you can bet $5 on any team to win and get $200 in free bets if they do. If you're listening from Illinois, mobile registration is back. And right now you can sign up for DraftKings Sportsbook simply by downloading the app right to your phone. And if Sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, you can still join in the action with DraftKings Pools. Everyone can play free all March long for a shot at over 250 thousand dollars in prizes unbelievable so download the DraftKings sportsbook app right now use promo code josh potter bet five dollars on any college hoops team to win and get two hundred dollars in free bets if they do if they win you win with promo code josh potter this week at DraftKings sportsbook 21 and over restrictions apply see show notes for details but let's get into a couple sports stories before we get our folks our fine roaches over in ukraine on the zoom here shall we and Aaron Rodgers is coming up here uh, because, well, you know, he could be a free agent next or not a free agent, but he could be playing for another team next season. He has not expressed one way or another if he wants to play with the Green Bay Packers at this point. Uh, but he has been on the Pat McAfee show recently, and he's discussing other things that are going on. He discussed uh, his endorsement for a horrifying 12-day cleanse that can sometimes involve oily enemas, bloodletting, and forced vomiting. And he was describing this on Pat McAfee's show, where he was describing all the shitting and the puking and everything like that, and the enemas, the oily enemas up his butt. And I started going like, hey, this is the one thing I kind of like, I think I should do this. Like, if Aaron Rodgers is doing this, he's at the peak of physical fitness, and my, my my body is dying. I should do this. Cleanse. And I'm thinking about doing it, and then doing it on the program. What do you think of that? There will be no news today, he told Pat McAfee. No decision on my future. As I was texting with you yesterday, I just got out of a 12-day panchakarma. Look that up. I know you did after we talked. It's a cleanse that originated in India. It's going, it's been going on for thousands of years, and it's something I've done in the off season. So I'm just getting my uh, hand above the sand now and seeing what's going on there. So it's described as a cleansing and purification technique, um, which is longstanding pseudo scientific Indian medicine system. Apparently, according to this article, I'm not going to go and say your Indian medicine is pseudo science. I'm not saying that. It's this fucking article. They're trying to paint Aaron Rodgers and his anti-vaxxing as being pseudoscience. Nothing Aaron Rodgers could possibly do involve science anymore after his anti-vaxxing claims. Uh, but again, you know, who knows what's going on in India with this fucking shit, right? <laughs> the best that can be said for it is that a tiny amount of data suggests uh, that uh, these herbal mixtures may help relieve... Uh, osteothyritis pain and manage type 2 diabetes but more data is needed to solidify those benefits but what it does is it really just it it makes you shit a whole bunch and puke a whole bunch i feel like that's got to clean you out and i gotta say the road coming back after covid has treated my body like a fucking sewer and my butt is just angry my ass is angry it's mad at me and it's acting as if uh, it is my dog that I had to put to sleep. Like when, my, when I knew when I had to put my dog to sleep when he was puking clear. And now I'm like, is my body puking clear out of my butt? Is that what's going on right now? Because that's what's happening. It's just like my, I'm not even shitting. It's just like I said, puking. It's just bleh. And I'm like, dude, we have to go to the doctor. And also maybe I try this shit, putting some enemas up my ass. 
because I would love this. I mean, he's like, uh, you know, he's talking about how it not only heals you physically, but I think it takes away mental stress. Well, after puking your guts out for a little while, you probably get a good night's sleep, you know? Uh, and then this, there's the spiritual aspect. I think it allows you to kind of enjoy the meditations a little bit more. So when I come out, my first thought is just intense gratitude for the people in my life. Well, that's some fucking horseshit. Who knows if that's true? I'm not buying that part of it. I just want to clean my body out. And I think this is a good start, but we'll go see a doctor and see what he says here. It goes on to discuss who the, who else does these types of procedures and, uh, the other benefits to them and things like that. Uh, but it says here, uh, there is, there's a portion of this that is credited to clog, uh, you know, there's things that go throughout your body that clog everything up. It's just, it's to get rid of the AMA, which I, whatever that means, you're going to need panchakarma. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm not going to be saying many things right coming up here because we're going to discuss our Ukrainian roaches and all the things that are happening in their lives over there in Ukraine in just a couple of moments. But first, I wanted to discuss Vitaly Klitschko. He is obviously a former heavyweight champion boxer. Uh, and now he is the mayor of the capital city, Kiev. And he is, I mean, the pictures of him and his brother, by the way, badass. I'm like, this is the mayor this is unreal. I can't imagine if fucking Garcetti had to go fight. He'd be fucking shitting his pants right now. How do we not have any fucking badass politics? We have no badass politicians. We are so fucked if we get invaded. We got Biden fucking stumbling around. They're going to just throw his body out there and hope that the tank like gets it just gets caught up in the gears of the tank. That's the best he could do is his just lay in front of the tank and hope that his body gets caught up in the fucking gears and it doesn't move anymore. That's the best we can hope for. Strap a Molotov cocktail to his chest and hope it explodes the tank. That's the best. And Garcetti, he's going to be like, you know, he'll have like servants fucking go out there and get shot before he does anything. It's fucking wild. So I wanted to discuss this mayor a little bit. I mean, he says in, in his statements and interviews and things like that, that he is one of the soldiers ready to defend their city. I don't have another choice. I have to do that. I will be fighting. And they, I mean, they technically they don't have a choice, which is, again, crazy that I if I was Ukrainian, I'd be over there. I'd they'd have to throw a gun into my hands and be like, go out there and do it. I'd be like, you sure? <laughs> can you at least show me where the Russians are? I can aim in the right direction. Just don't run in front of me at all. I believe in Ukraine. I believe in my country and I believe in my people, he said. And, uh, man, I wonder, I want to find out down the road here how many kills him and like Zelensky are getting, you know what I mean? Cause you know, they're out there doing, it. I don't know about Zelensky, but you know, this guy is out there fucking actually taking shit down. And that brings me to the ghost of Kiev, by the way. And I understand, you know, there's, this is the thing that bugs me about people when it comes to things, stories like the ghost of Kiev, no one needs your ass on the internet pointing out that it's fake. No one cares. If it's a story that gives the people of Ukraine some hope, just let it be. No one needs your ass in fucking Idaho fucking Googling about it and being like, well, actually, uh, the top ace in all of history has about six kills and that was lifetime and this is in one day. It's impossible. No one fucking cares, bro. You know, just let them have it. What do you go around telling children that Santa's not real too? grow up? Just fucking let it be. No one wants to hear your facts right now, dork, okay? So just chill out. And when we come back here in a couple of moments, we're going to talk to two people, two roaches, who listen to this show, who are in Ukraine right now. And I have no idea what to expect in these conversations. I'm just trying to get a sense of what, you know, their lives were just like ours not too long ago. I mean, they were, you know, one dude's a photographer. And now he's a fucking soldier. So let's we'll find out what that fucking shit's like. You know what I mean? That's really the the key or the reason I want to have them on is to find out how ro other roaches in Ukraine are living right now through all of this. And if they find any sense of joy or happiness or anything like that, or if it's all just fucking hell right now. So we'll find out. And it could get interesting. It could get sad. I'm not quite sure. It's not going to be funny. <laughs> I might imagine there might be some dark funny moments but i'm not aiming to try and make light of any of this it's fucking war for christ's sake and again these are people that reached out to me and wanted to get their word out so i i feel the duty to let them do that so we'll be back with them in just a couple of moments here on the josh potter show 
Today's Josh Potter Show is brought to us by HelloFresh. Boy, oh boy, when that HelloFresh kit arrives at my door, do I get excited because my meals are basically planned for the rest of the week. And I don't feel like a lazy loser because I get to actually cook it, you know? And I sure, HelloFresh does all the hard heavy lifting for you. They portion out all the ingredients. They keep it all right and tight, and they tell you exactly how to prepare it so you don't have to mess it up. And man, oh man, makes me look like an all-star when I'm putting these meals together. And like I said, everything's pre-portioned ingredients right to your door, including farm-fresh produce that arrives within a week. Uh, HelloFresh has... Fit and wholesome recipes for satisfying and nutritious meals so you don't have to eat garbage all the time. I mean, this stuff is good for you and it tastes good as well. They offer the flexibility you need uh, to easily customize your order online or on the app. The menu is expansive, friend. Customize your favorite dishes with their new Hello Custom offerings, too. So maybe you don't like tomatoes. Wipe all the tomatoes out with Hello Custom, a new feature that HelloFresh has to offer. And they offer up 50 menu and market items to choose from every week, including veggie, fit and wholesome, family friendly, and gourmet options, providing plenty of variety. So right now, go to HelloFresh.com slash Josh Potter 16 and use code Josh Potter 16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Again, HelloFresh.com slash Josh Potter 16. Use code Josh Potter 16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. It's highly uh, encouraged to go there and do that right now and get on it because you don't want to waste time. America's number one meal kit, HelloFresh. Today's Josh Potter Show also brought to us by ExpressVPN. Does it make sense that the same company who controls half of online retail also passively eavesdrops on your private conversations at home? I don't think that's fair at all. What about the idea that a single company controls 90% of the internet searches, runs your email service, and gets to track everything you do on your smartphone? Big tech is more powerful than most countries, and they profit by exploiting your personal data, and it's time to put a layer of protection between you and your online activity and these tech juggernauts and that's why, my friend, I use ExpressVPN. Also, I can watch Dodger games here in L.A. That's the, that's really the selfish part of it. But all that stuff about the tech juggernauts, that's important, too, obviously. Think about how much of your life is on the freaking Internet. Sadly, every site you visit, video you watch, or message you send gets tracked and data mined. But when you run ExpressVPN on your device, the software hides your IP address, something big tech can use to personally identify you. So ExpressVPN makes your activity harder to trace and sell to advertisers. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of your internet data and keeps you safe from hackers and eavesdroppers on your network. So right now, stop handing over your personal data to the big tech monopoly that mines your activity and sells your information. Protect yourself with the VPN that I trust to keep me safe online. That's expressvpn.com slash Josh. Again, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Josh to get three or three extra free months. That's wild. ExpressVPN.com slash Josh right now to learn more. All right. We're here now with Zevalod, and you are a photographer by trade, right? Uh, yeah, I've never worked like, prof- I mean, I work professionally kind of, but yeah, I worked in IT before. Oh, you worked in IT before. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. You mentioned that you are six miles, what, south of Kiev? Yeah, yeah, it's something around that, yeah. So tell us real quick, as now it's been about a week or so since uh, the invasion happened and began, how has life gone upside down or changed or anything like that? Give us a rundown of what you've been experiencing. Uh, when it all started, it was on 24th, uh, like 5 in the morning, 5 a.m., and uh, we woke up from explosions. It was f- fucking scary. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Uh, yeah, and we didn't know what to do. Like, I was saying we should, like, move west or somewhere. Who's we? Do you live with family? Uh, yeah, I live with parents. I'm 20 years old. Okay, um, and uh, your parents, did they, uh, they're, are they still with you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, my brother's here now. We uh, took him here from uh, uh, yeah from Kiev because it's I, I think it's more more safe here and um, yeah it was uh, scary the first day first two days I think 
but now it's it's more quiet here than in Kiev. We don't hear that much ex that many explosions. And um I, I mean, I was worried. I slept on 24th. I slept like 2 hours because I was I was up until like 2 in the morning. I was uh, like checking news and stuff on Twitter and uh, I already saw there was I couldn't confirm it. I just saw that um in uh, in a city that's being bombed like constantly and uh there was like at 1 a.m already a combat alarm for our our military and like nobody could confirm it and uh, the airspace was already closed like b before the explosion started so it's uh yeah i was i was hoping it wasn't like it was false and and then we just woke up to that and now, when did you get word that like it got dire to the point where it's like everyone aged 16 to 60 has to stay and fight, all men have to stay and fight? How did they communicate these types of things to, to you on the ground out there? Uh, it was pretty immediate. I, I think like six in the morning already there was a... Um, the president said, like, uh, recorded the video, just said that we're uh, um, we're introducing um, the martial law uh, in in the country, and uh, like, uh, I think you could leave until um, I don't remember the time, but you you could leave uh, leave the country if you were a man, and uh, like there was until... a window that you could have left before yeah, they instated that sort of thing. When you heard that now, like, I was think I was trying to put myself in your shoes, you know? If they told me that, I would have been like, are you sure you want me out there doing this kind of thing? But, <laughs> you know, so I mean, like, I couldn't even imagine what went through your mind when you found out that you might be confronted with the fact that you have to fight. Uh, I personally, I didn't. I had... Um... Uh, we have conscri conscription here, so I went to like a couple of years ago, maybe went to the uh, like conscription office or whatever, and uh, I wasn't uh, capable to fight. So oh, so you get uh, you kind of get a pass on it. Yeah, and I think my friends too. They, you don't really get like forced to to do this kind of stuff. That just people come and get the rifles. You, you don't. There's no police like going around and saying you should fight. There's... Interesting. Okay, that's what I was curious about. How strict it was, or if it was more of a patriotism thing, like to to volunteer and to to say like, hey, get on out here. We need as many as we can get. Um, it is just wild though to think about uh, having to face that. You know what I mean? Like, I you know, I I said to the folks before you came on, you're a roach just like the rest of us. And you're in a modern country, and the fact that you're faced with this is insane. But I want to hear more about, you know, obviously what you have been dealing with. Obviously, you said it got quieter now, but what's going through your home? And do you have any plans to leave, or are you just going to hunker down and, and ride it out? I, I think it's. I'm just going to wait for a couple of days. I think it's it's getting quieter, and they don't have any resources to fight this this war. They they were expecting it to last from like the 20th of February, I think we got like secret like, like plans and uh, this operation, operation in quotes, because they call it that, but it's like basically a war, yeah. full, full scale. And um, uh, they were expecting to fight from like 20th of February to until like 6th of March, but like in 15 days or something like that. And uh, they were expecting to capture everything for like in like three days maybe uh, but they don't have any resources to f we're already like a week in and it's it's not yeah it's been not absolutely winning. inspiring and it makes you know obviously there's we don't have the same tensions and fears that you have but obviously watching from afar you you, you have growing ones that what could be beyond this and the resilience of the Ukrainian people has been inspiring to the point where you're just like, hey, man, if they go somehow, if they get past them, 
the rest of the world is ready to like fuck them up. I feel, you know what I mean? So I, uh, I'm, I'm definitely inspired by everything that's been coming out in terms of the good news. Now you said in the first couple of days with the explosions, how, how scary it was. Have you been able to go outside and survey like what was damaged in your town or anything like that? Was there anything that you, you know, maybe a place you go to often or a building that you're, you walk by all the time that got damaged or anything? I haven't gone personally to, to Kiev. Uh, because like in in the, all, all this since 24th I, I didn't go to Kiev yet and I didn't see any uh, um, any destruction and my town got lucky we like far away but there's some reports that in our town there's uh, like uh, marauders just uh, coming in some houses but they didn't really do much and hmm. also there's like um some weird people walking around from time to time but uh, our like territorial defense basically like normal people with guns are, are guarding everything so we got this under control and uh we have an lav standing just like a couple <laughs> like a couple hundred meters from us oh wow so i wasn't sure what when you said there were explosions that you were that you were hearing those were happening in kiev then and you, uh, you can hear Kiev, them all the way where you were living. Uh, yeah, Kiev, and there's a there's a city north here, and uh, there's a international airport to the east, like uh, maybe like six miles to, like there's a different there's a big big city, yeah, also, and uh, there was um, they were hitting that, and uh, that's what we heard first, I think, because there was a air defense system and those i think it, some of it got destroyed but most of it got uh uh the, the mis missiles got shot down by our military and that's what we were hearing the first like couple hours basically just the uh, missiles getting shot down but some of it hit yeah of course right but no, that's, that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's wild, man. I mean, what, what do you, I mean, obviously this week has been hellacious and hopefully it, it's not, uh, going to last much longer, but what have you missed in the last week? Like, what do you look forward to most about getting back to like everyday life again? I, I don't have, I haven't seen like most of my friends uh, sure. for, for a long time now and uh yeah it's probably... have you been able to stay in touch with them uh to make sure they're all safe and all of that yeah i keep in touch with every one of them and how are they and, doing uh, have any, has anybody like done anything gnarly or seen anything crazy that uh you know is something you're like hey be careful <laughs> you know what i mean like or is everyone kind of has the same game plan as you to hunker down and ride it out uh nothing crazy like there's uh i know i know that my friends know people that like captured or like I don't, I don't know like captured uh prisoners of war and uh like i know from for a fact that all of that all of that stuff is true like most of it maybe not all of it because every every government i think lies and to some degree because they they don't want us to like panic and stuff but sure. it's not it's not nearly as bad as the russian government lying of course yeah it's not the same type of propaganda if anything it's just to keep people calm as you mentioned but and, uh, uh oh i'm sorry uh, go ahead on. i just want to show that uh, i have my ukrainian passport here like uh, id and like it's real oh sure so. no and no one's <laughs> no one's guessing <laughs> no one's second guessing that we're gonna have to blur out the details of it but thank you for uh, i mean yeah uh, yeah I there are it, people you worry. think there are people out there that don't think that I mean, like, I know you mentioned to me on DM about uh, you asked if there was anybody from Russia who, who watched the show. And I, I do not know until this happened. I was unaware of the amount of people from Ukraine who listened to the show. So um, no one from Russia has reached out uh, in any way. Uh, so I'm not certain. Uh, but, you know, from what what they show here and again, like you mentioned with the with the images and stuff like that, that could be projected to show one way or the other. But it seems like many people in Russia are against this invasion as well, from what I've seen. So I know that they're probably pumping propaganda into their own media outlets and things like that. But I don't think that uh, that everybody, at least, there's a good portion that aren't buying it, you know? So I, I think that's something that's hopeful as well. And you got to hope one of these billionaires 
uh, that are want to stay billionaires, just fucking murder Putin already and get him out of there. That's what I. <laughs> yeah. That's my hope. There's like there's like two two billionaires that already like uh, put a bounty on his head. <laughs> well, there you go. Two that's million dollars. Money talks, and the guy who owns Chelsea had to put his soccer team up for sale and you know that doesn't rub him the right way so he's probably <laughs> upset but i was i thought you were going to say you know obviously i understand the you know you want to see your friends and you want your family to be safe those are things that you can't wait to get back to in everyday life but it's, there's got to be one thing like superficial too that you miss doing you know what i mean something very small selfishly that you miss too that you could have back mm. if, there, if there was one thing that you could choose I haven't jade my D for a while now. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. You got your parents. You got your brother. You're all in one room. There's bombs going off. Yeah, my dick yeah. wouldn't get hard from that either. I mean, that's, I get that, dude. I was wondering about that. And man, you probably haven't had the desire to J your D either. I mean, I, I couldn't even imagine. Uh, I mean, is there, a, is there like, has there been any sort of epiphanies that you've had because of this, though, that once normal life proceeds and continues... You know, you're not going to let this go by or you're not going to let this slip anymore or something like that. Have you had any thoughts like that? I, I haven't really traveled Ukraine a lot. And like I've been to a few cities around here, so I'm probably going to do that first and, and probably get a job. I haven't had a normal <laughs> job for a while. Well, who knows? I mean, I, you're taking some wonderful photos and everyone should follow you on Instagram. We're going to put your Instagram up on here because you've been taking some amazing photos during this entire time. Uh, who knows, maybe a job in that department, is that something you would want or, or look forward to or, or you want to pursue? It, yeah, I kind of worked like as a photographer, but not like in like, it was a part-time job, like a gig. Sure. Freelance. Yeah, yeah. But who knows, maybe you'll get but, more of those now after taking some of these great images and um, man, you know, I and, and thank you for reaching out and, and coming on the show and I, I hope... Uh, you know, this all wraps up real quick and you're going to keep me up abreast of your, you know, going forward and things like that. We want to make sure you're all right and everything. And uh, thank you so much for giving us some insight as to what's going on. Do you have anything you want to say to the people around the world before uh, before you go? Uh, just don't believe Russians. <laughs> I don't think anybody's believing in my friend, not at least yeah. over here in, in the United States. Everybody's pretty pro Ukraine for the for the very unless there's like a small three percent of something that I'm unaware of. I really believe uh, that's not something that you have to worry about. Everybody is very much on the side of Ukraine and its people. And uh, your president, man. I mean, I'm jealous. I wish we had half a president compared to that guy. <laughs> I mean, what a what I, a guy. I had. I had I had doubts about him for a long time, but now it's like no, this guy he stayed here for like for for this whole thing and it's it's incredible yeah yeah did you ever think because he was obviously a guy who was on your television he was a comedian i mean when this all went down did, were you like oh great we got this fucking actor as the president <laughs> uh no he actually like the first couple of videos that he posted it, it was like it kind of given me hope to be honest it was sure. it was like really i was like this guy is like is the shit <laughs> hell yeah that's like, what i said too and then we got biden over here calling going the people of uranus i don't even you know he doesn't even know what he where he, what he's talking about i'm like yeah, if they yeah. ever came over here we're gonna have we're gonna have to throw his corpse into the tank gears that's as good as we're gonna get out of him you know but thank yeah. you so much dude i appreciate you coming on the show and uh keep me updated and stay safe and tell everyone over there we love them and we're rooting for you more than anything all right sure yeah thank you for covering this stuff of course. Uh, giving it coverage, yeah. It's the least I can do. <laughs> Trust me, there's people doing it better and more thorough. But, um, you know, as again, I just wanted to get another Roach's perspective of things happening over there. So we thank you so much. And, uh, and again, keep me updated and we'll talk to you soon, okay? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you for coming on, dude. I appreciate it a great deal. All right. On with us now, another fellow Roach, Oksana Takach. <laughs> How are you? Um, not great. <laughs> not great. <laughs> Clearly, yes. Tell us where in the world you are and what you've experienced in this past week, please. Oh, you mean the longest week of my life? Of course. Um, I am currently in Lviv in the west of Ukraine, 
um, right now it's, I mean, probably the safest place in Ukraine, but there is no safe place in Ukraine right now. Um, I was actually in Berlin when this all happened because I, I flew to Berlin because I was like, there is going to be war. I should not be in Ukraine. Um, and then uh, I kind of watched all this happen and I decided to come back. Interesting. Just, I don't know. Be you here. had to be here and, and did yeah. you have family there, obviously. And are you with your family? Or did you come back to be with anybody in particular? Um, not with anybody. I'm with my friends right now. My family is in another city, which is, I mean, it's, it's also relatively safe. I just felt like, I mean, if we fight, like we fight, like, what am I going to do? Be in Europe while my country is being destroyed. It's stupid. Like, I'm going to, I don't know, be here and try to defend it with like zero upper body strength. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, <laughs> well, that's what I, I was saying earlier, too. I said, I couldn't imagine if they, you know, if we were invaded and I was faced with having to especially you know being a man they say you know if you're 16 to 60 in ukraine you have to f to fight i thought i was like, do they really want me out there i mean am i going to be more of a hindrance than i would be an asset you know i, I just i imagine those things and i couldn't imagine being in your position obviously you went to berlin for now did you have much warning obviously we all saw the signs and things like that but being in ukraine did you have much warning of the troops kind of gathering at the border and things like that? I mean, they they were at the border for like a year. I mean, we were guessing. So it was like, I was I went there and I was really annoyed because my friend told me to, and I was like, oh, why are you making me do this? Because like, I have life here and I need to like hang out in Berlin. What like what do I, what do, I do here? Um, but he was right, right? So we were like, we were hoping nothing was going to happen. I'm just going to go back home, like after my Berlin trip. Um, but yeah. And now it you're back. Kind of like, yeah. And so you said you have no upper body strength and you're but you're ready to fight. <laughs> have you yes. have you been faced with maybe the possibility of having to actually fight yet? Not yet. They they haven't come to the west yet. Um they did bomb the military base here. So and we we have these um air raid sirens a few times a day because every time an aircraft comes from Belarus then we have the sirens so we have to hide um, because there's always a risk that they're going to drop a bomb and leave. Um, but they are sort of fighting the, the trying to take over the regions that are closer to Russia first. Um, so yeah, so everybody's fleeing here, but yeah, there's always risks. Something's going to get destroyed. Um, I don't know. I just, I feel, I feel much better emotionally being here. That's interesting than being, than Europe, being yeah. anywhere else. And so many of your countrymen have gone, uh, understandably so, to Poland and other places. You have no desire to send family there, or do you? Do you tell certain fam family members, "Hey, get to get and get get out there"? You know. Oh, my parents aren't going. I'm going to be doing that. My mom was like, "I'm going to join the defense and <laughs> fight for it." Like, what am I going to greet them at the door? Um, I mean, I was at the Polish border because I was. I was thinking at the beginning I was going to. Um, like my friend was going to leave me his car and I'm going to like be he helping refugees at the border. But we came there and we were like, oh, the refugees are, I mean, relatively fine. Like they, the whole Poland is helping them. So sure. it didn't feel u useful. And then, and then we, um, so my friend was still going to go to leave by train. So we went to the train station. It was like this dramatic moment when I'm like sending him to war and I'm staying here with his car and we were like crying and then we thought the train would be totally empty because like there's a war <laughs> and we come there and there's like a huge line of people that have been waiting there from like 9 a.m yelling at us for cutting the line because they all want to go back sure and it was so kind of like we were like, we cried about that like it was so beautiful that all these people and there were no children or old people there were like people our age that just wanted to go back and like I don't know do something that's wild here. yeah that's so it was and after that, it was like, oh, it's not even a decision. Like, we are driving back home. That's, right? I mean, that's what I find so inspiring about this whole thing. And it's weird to have, like, this obvious, one of the most terrible events in the history of my lifetime happening, but find such inspiration and, like, optimism from the resilience of the Ukrainian people. It's something that I find absolutely inspiring, and, and I find optimism in that. I don't know what it is, but it's it's strange. And I love that you mentioned being there and seeing this type of wave of resilience. You mentioned the air raid sirens and how when they happen, you have to take shelter. Do you have shelter in your home, or are you like... I've noticed people going into the subways and things like that. Do you have subways in your part of Ukraine, or... Um, yeah, it's an old joke. We don't have the subway here, but um, we do have these old 
um, buildings that are like super sturdy and they all have basements. We checked out the basement here. It's full of dead spiders. Oh, it's no. not great. <laughs> doesn't, and doesn't, that's where you have to go amongst the dead elephants. spiders. That's terrible. <laughs> yes, it's kind of creepy. Um, but we decided it's actually better to hide. Um, there's a spot here that's away from all of the windows in case they, you know, get blown up. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a spot that seems pretty safe. And and the basement doesn't seem quite safe because I don't know if, if the building collapses, like how are we going to get out right, of it? Right, it'll just land on but, top of you. Yes, but these walls probably won't collapse, right? Like the smaller walls will collapse. So we decided we were going to stay here, which is somehow more scary because then you're going to hear the, the explosion. But uh, yeah, I think it's better. Um, and also, you know, if, if it, when it's in the middle of the night, you can just like crawl <laughs> to, the, to the spot and just continue sleeping, sleeping it's not very far floor. away from you that's the, <laughs> you can yeah, crawl to it yeah so that's, exactly exactly yeah. now you mentioned all the deluge of people coming to the west because obviously they're in more war-torn parts of the country are you are you taking people in are people like opening their homes to these people who are coming or oh yeah i mean it's insane how many i mean nobody's working right now like you can't you can't be working right now so For everybody's sure. doing something and so when you're like trying to volunteer and you go like oh can i help you make molotov cocktails and they're like oh <laughs> we have enough hands go away so everybody's doing something everybody's like host hosting people and bringing food and bringing supplies from poland um i have friends so friends um that i work with that got stuck in Kharkiv while it was being completely obliterated but they were out in the country and finally they got out and so they are trying to drive west and i'm hoping they will stay with me Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing how, how sort of, how fast we all mobilized. Yeah. It's a, it's yeah, like I said, it's that. very inspiring. And I noticed that there were like breweries making, they, they converted from making beer to making Molotov cocktails and things like that. Uh, did you know how to make yeah. a Molotov cocktail before this? Is it something that you learn as a Ukrainian person growing up or is it something that you've had <laughs> in to, school? Yeah. If you learn it in school, in, how to make a Molotov school? cocktail. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to make one yet. I'm hoping I will. I'm hoping to learn soon because, uh, you know, what am I going to do? I'm well, this all inspired me. I, I've watched many YouTube videos and I think I can make a mean one now. So I, I'm trying, you know, anything I could contribute. Maybe I can come over and make a few of them. I noticed old ladies were making them and throwing them at tanks. That was awesome to see. I saw the videos yeah. of that. It's Did you wild. see the videos of like old people stealing tanks? That's oh, like, yeah. There's a TikTok like, of a woman who described. So happy. I thought it might have been you for a couple of moments uh, on TikTok describing how to start up an abandoned Russian tank. Did you see those? That was, I think that's actually a Russian woman and the video is quite old. Oh, okay. So it's propaganda. Recovered and, no, no, no. It, I mean, I think she made it like a few years back, but we were like, oh, this is great. We have to, we have to share this because we all need to know. Yeah. Yeah. For <laughs> sure. It shows how a freaking tank works. It's insane. And have you know, I mean, the the resilience yeah. of the Ukrainian people has been so inspiring. And also just knowing like most of these Russian soldiers probably don't even want to be doing this. So they're just like, fuck this after a little while. And they just walk back, it seems. You know what I mean? That's and it reminds me of wars we've gotten into. Uh, <laughs> but maybe I'm wrong in that sort of notion, too. Maybe that's I something mean, I'm being seeing. I'm seeing that I, I mean, am being fed. Some of them, for sure, they do not want to be here. But and like the, you know, there are many like liberal Russians that don't want this. But I've been thinking about this. Like their culture is quite, you know, um, what is the word? I'm forgetting the word. <laughs> quite imperialistic. Mm -hmm. So they they actually a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them believe this is what they should be doing because they think their culture is so awesome that they, they have to impose it on like lesser cultures such as ukraine so i think many of these soldiers particularly maybe like the higher ranking ones they are they think this is great like they're bombing a country that they think they need to uh, you know take over and they're probably driving some pleasure from the war but the the younger um the younger soldiers yeah it's basically like just meat for putin because yeah. he didn't you know he didn't supply you know good the weapons or anything they're just kind of like he, he, that's like his strategy he's just sending more and more people that are dying yeah it's so it's strange tragic. you would think that they would have like you know you hear russia it's a superpower it's a nuclear power you'd think they'd have tanks that didn't have like smokestacks on them from the 80s still or whatever the hell that you know they seems like they're just dusting off soviet weaponry and trying to use it and thankfully you folks have some better grade weapons that 
I guess you got from us or from somebody else, you know, in the, in NATO down the road. But uh, now I, I asked this of another uh, gentleman who we had on who is in Ukraine. Selfishly, there obviously you want your friends and your family to be safe and you want yourself to be safe uh, beyond all of this. But what do you miss most of regular everyday life that you can't wait to have uh. again? Oh my god, I don't know what that is anymore. My brain is is like completely in war mode. Of course, of <laughs> course. Because like a week ago was, you know, there was like anxiety and sadness, and I was crying randomly, and now like I think yesterday it switched, and I'm no, now I'm just like angry. I'm just sure. angry all the time. And you're also and you have this invigorated, right? I mean, all of this is tragic. Like, but the more the more stuff they bomb, the more civilians they kill, the angrier we all get. Like they think the more aggressive they become then we'll get scared, we get less scared, we get, we get you know, more angry, even sure. like tiny people like me. So I don't even, I used to have plans for this year. I don't even know what they were. <laughs> I'm like, this is, you know, I'm sort yeah, of, of course. I'm not really thinking about the future. I'm like, okay, I'm, it's very laser focused. Of course. Um, yeah. That's Cause, wild. Because we are thinking like, okay, we're going to like run out of food because the supply chains are broken. Maybe we'll like not have electricity and not have, not have like warm water. So you have to plan for all that. And it takes up so much space in your brain because you're surviving. And then I'm like, oh, I'm, I wanted to go to Burning Man this year. Like, who cares? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> exactly right. But that's the thing. So, I mean, do you think that this will affect you in a way where when hopefully everyday life comes back, you will be forever changed obviously but hope you know do you think it'll be for the worse no no i think this is like if if i mean if this doesn't end in some tragedy like in, like a nuclear war this will be a great opportunity for ukraine like we will we will come out much more united and much more democratic and and uh, yeah we'll build just a, a country that's much better to live in and significantly better than russia <laughs> for sure and that's what's so obviously so inspiring about the whole thing. And I mean, you've really put Ukraine on the map. I think a lot of people have been watching this and seen the resilience of the people and, and maybe they didn't even know where Ukraine was a week ago or, but now, I mean, you've got the whole world behind you uh, rooting for you and uh, hopefully you'll get some more support that is tangible from the rest of the world yeah. too, you know? Exactly. Because think about it, like this is not some random attack that the Russia wanted to do. Like they've been doing this for centuries. Mm -hmm. It's just that nobody cared. And it's, this is like an unprecedented because for the first time in Ukrainian history, we we like gathered enough momentum and enough attention from the world that we could actually like, you know, fight back and, and, and have a little bit of revenge for all those years. Of, of oppression. Um, yeah. So yeah, this is kind of exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is strange that I can see it in your face. Like you mentioned yesterday, it switched. But now, like I said, it, it, the way that I've felt from afar, going from obviously just ultimate sadness, watching all of this unfold on television to being inspired by your people, it seems like you have that switch happen in your head too, where it's like now you are even more patriotic and uh, you're ready to to lay it all on the line. It's it's even inspiring seeing your face light up like that kind of, you know what I mean? As strange as that sounds. Thank you. I don't mean, I don't know. I don't like the word patriotic. I think it's kind of uh, very, very much 20th century, you know? Sure. It, this is more about democracy, right? Because if we were like super patriotic, then we, we would like not like the people that speak Russian here or the, pe the Russian people that live here that had to hide in subway stations as well, because a lot of them live in East Ukraine. Um, but we don't care about that anymore. Like this is more about, hey, this asshole attacked a peaceful, you know, democratic country. Like this is not okay. Right. So yeah, it's more about that. Well, Oksana, and I think that's why so many countries. Sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, please continue. So many countries. Yes. I think that so many countries protect us as well because they are protecting the you know their democratic values too. Of course, yeah. I mean, obviously, if you guys fall, who's next? You know what I'm saying? So. It's just, uh, it's been inspiring watching the resilience and the fact that your president didn't just roll over and the people didn't roll over. It's it's truly inspiring, honestly. And thank you for telling us about your experiences. Is there anything you want to share with people around the world before you go or something that you want to point them to or anything like that? Um, okay, two things. 
Um, first of all, there's a lot of Russian propaganda out there. Um, it's all false. <laughs> check your history. Check the facts. It's, I mean, it's the same thing they did with Trump, except that it worked with Trump and it's not going to work this time. Um, and second, so yeah, don't let yourself get distracted from reality. It's gaslighting. <laughs> and second is donate to the army. Donate to the army fund or donate to like the, human, the humanitarian causes for Ukraine um, or, you know, push push countries, push your governments to do more because we really need your help for the next week or two. This is very important for the whole world, really. For sure. So, yeah, support us as much as you can. Yeah. And I know, I mean, I, I talked with um, another gentleman and he was mentioning the propaganda, too. And I don't know that that's an issue here. in the. I mean, everybody, I feel other than maybe a fringe a group of people here in the United States, everybody is on the side of the Ukrainian people. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that we are getting fed the propaganda as much as perhaps people over in Eastern Europe are getting it. Uh, but, you know, obviously there are some fringe, like I said, aspects of our society uh, that are spewing, not propaganda necessarily, but just, you know, looking at it from the other side, which is silly to do, but it's like, again, like you said, it's all false. And I don't think it's as much of a worry here in the United States. We're fully behind you. Uh, and I'm sorry that you have to deal with all that horse shit <laughs> that's going on. I mean, it is absolutely mind boggling to me <laughs> what, what, uh, you've had to experience and it is the definitely. evolution of Horseshit. your thoughts about it. And, um, you know, we're all with you though, a hundred percent. And, like, I thank you for telling us about those humanitarian efforts and where to donate and things like that. And I hope that everybody out there does it. And I hope that you stay safe and all your loved ones stay safe and uh, you keep up the, the resilience because, again, it's very inspiring. And I thank you for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank stay you. safe and keep in touch and send those links and we'll talk soon, okay? All right. Thank you so much for coming on. I want to say a big thank you, obviously, to our Ukrainian roaches who came onto the program, Oksana and Zevalov. Stay strong. The fact that the Russian government is preventing Zevalov from jerking off is the ultimate crime. And I believe Putin should be brought in front of the Geneva Convention for such, tr for such crimes and tried. And they should throw the book at him. Nevertheless, we march on. I will be at Helium Comedy Club March 11th. It's going to be one big show. It's going to be fun. So if you're out there in the Portland, Oregon area, come on out. Tickets can be found in my Instagram at Josh underscore Potter or my Twitter at J underscore Potter. Other than that, get signed up for the Patreon, patreon.com slash the Josh Potter show. The link's in the description. Get subscribed, five bucks a month. You get a whole different podcast, Potter and Bergman, that goes up pretty instantly after we tape it. That's the whole purpose of doing this audio-wise is that we can turn it around instantly. So you get us right away. Instant reaction to things on the road, etc., etc. So hopefully you'll get signed up very soon and continue to subscribe to this channel here on YouTube. And if you listen on audio, subscribe, rate, review, and uh, all of that. Thank you so much for doing so already. And we will see you next Tuesday right here on The Josh Potter Show.